Welcome to the American Geophysical Union's podcast about the scientists and the methods behind the science. These are stories you won't read in the manuscript or hear in a lecture. I'm Shane Hanlon. And I'm Nancy Bompey. And welcome to Third Pod from the Sun. Okay, I wanted to ask you, did you ever do the science fair experiment thing um, in middle school or high school when you were growing up? Well, never did the science fairs, but I do distinctly remember in elementary school cooking hot dogs on the roof of the school, using some setup with tinfoil, perhaps to um, learn about solar energy or something like that. Not quite sure. Or about uh, multiple health code violations. Or that, you know. <laughs> I, uh, I think that... I did, and I remember some of them, but none of them were really noteworthy. Uh, but I wanted to ask you, did you ever do the kind of pinnacle science experiment, the, the baking soda volcano? So I do remember that, I think, doing it in my kitchen at home and my mom getting mad because we made a mess, you know, something like that. What about you? I, I never did it. Part of it was because I don't think my, my mother would have tolerated it. We are, there's no way we were making that mess in our house. Uh, but also, I just don't think I was really impressed with it. I just think I wanted to see like the real thing, go to some exotic location and see lava. Well, as it turns out, you don't need to go to some exotic remote location to see lava. You can actually see real live lava in a parking lot in Syracuse, New York. Wait, what are you talking about? So, a few weeks ago, Lauren LaPuma, who's another one of our producers, and I took a road trip up to Syracuse, New York to see lava being made. Hey, Shane. Hey, Lauren. Yeah, it was so amazing. So, there are these two professors at Syracuse, Jeff Carson, who's a geologist. I'm a professor of geology in the Department of Earth Sciences. And Bob Wysocki, who's an artist. An associate professor in the School of Art teach sculpture. And Jeff and Bob have cooked up this crazy project where they have a giant furnace and they take rock, melt it down to make lava in a parking lot behind the Comstock art facility. Yeah, and all without having to go to an actual volcano. Yeah, so the project actually started because Bob is a sculptor and he was making what he calls geomorphically accurate sand dunes in galleries for a couple of years. Then in 2009, he saw some slag that came off of an iron furnace that looked like lava and he had this idea. He's like, well, maybe I can make lava myself. So what he did was he went to the Syracuse University's website and went to the Earth Sciences Department and looked up the first person he could find with lava next to their name, and that happened to be Jeff Carson. So without further ado, let's hear from Bob. My desire and interest in making lava was out of, I wanted to be a landscape painter, but all the great landscape painting in my mind, and historically has been done two to 300 years ago. So instead of painting, I actually wanted to make my own landscapes as accurately as possible. I had been making geomorphically accurate sand dunes in galleries, in museums, in art centers for three years. And it was, I, I wanted to shift to something a little more involved and I'd, saw, I, I'd seen something uh, in, in October of 2009 out of an iron furnace that looked like lava. And I, I researched it for two weeks and looked up Jeff to see who in our science could tell me what to melt down. And he was a department chair, and I was an untenured faculty member. And as this, I don't want to say it was, it was a social contract in academia, but he's, he had... Professional courtesy. Professor courtesies. He had to talk to me at least for two to three minutes. Seriously. Like, it was two to three minutes. I figure, and I, I, because he's the chair, I can just post up outside his office, and he has to talk to me. And his secretary said he has about five minutes before he has a meeting. Yeah, she's a winking at you. Yes, and um, we, have the we, we have the whack job from the art department down here who wants to talk to you about melting some rocks. All geologists have people who come in and say, is this gold? Some yes. Some piece of rock they found in their driveway. The physicists always are asked, the physics guys always ask, I just need to suspend gravity in this gallery for 30 seconds. Yeah, just Not even that long, funny. five seconds, just no gravity. So I knew from that, and I went and asked him, I said, look, I can do this, I can hit these temperatures. I've looked, these are kind of the melting temperatures, these different rocks, but do I just go out in the driveway behind our building and yeah. throw a bunch of gravel in the crucible? He said, no, 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 no. You, you want to start from a known quantity and there's certain, certain rocks and we can get them, it's easy enough to get, that will melt and become lava. You know, there's lots of big scientific questions regarding how lava behaves, the physics of how it flows, and not to mention you know, related questions like, how do you live with lava flows? People in Hawaii know all about this, 
Are there ways to divert the lava flow? Uh, can we uh, can we use it commercially uh, in various ways? I mean, so all of these things are things that would be worth exploring. And uh, boy, these things came to mind for me in this incredible rush as Bob was telling me about this. And as I realized that he wasn't just interested in making ashtrays or something like that, you know, that yeah. we weren't just going to do, you know, summer camp crafts or something. I can tell you what he thought. It was what was supposed to be the courtesy three to five minute talk or yeah. meeting. Uh, um, I didn't get out of his office for almost an hour. Yeah. yeah. And by the time he got back to his office, I'd sent him an email with yeah. two pages. It was ideas like, this is all the things do. we could do. Hooked. Was this a fresh, was this a fresh batch? Yep. Right. But not to sound tacky, but this sounds like a match made in academic heaven. Uh, but I want to know, how did they actually get to, like, what's the science of it? So basically they needed rock. I mean, lava is just melted rock, basically. Yes, they had to find a source of rock, and the rock they use is called basalt, and basalt is just old lava that has cooled and hardened into rock. So Jeff and Bob just Googled where to buy basalt. Basalt is the most common volcanic rock on our planet. You know, when, when you look at the, our planet, I always tell our students, there's the yellow continents, and then there's the blue part, right? And we always think, oh, that's the water, right? Well, that water's on top of volcanic terrain. It's all lava underneath there. But what we're doing is uh, pouring this rejuvenated or reincarnated old lava. It's about a billion years old. We get it from the mid-continent rift, a big giant rift zone that was very much like the East African rift is today. We just buy that material. It's all ground up. It costs very little. And it's, I don't want to say it's no nothing rock, but it's just that rock that's used for lots of things. It's primarily, it's quarried for road construction and also railroad in railroad, the base, uh, railroad bits. It's the hardest basalt in North America. Well, wait, what did they do? Did they just put rock in a furnace and melt it? Well, first they had to find a furnace that was hot enough to melt rock. Yeah, and then they discovered that melting rock is a little more complicated than they actually thought it was. I knew that the gas furnace that we have in the floor that we use in the art foundry was hot enough. We have to be around above 1250 to 1300 C. This isn't just, you know, Campbell's soup that you put on your stove top and, and heat up. It, the amount of R&D and just flying blind, it's like Bob said, Sure, go ahead and look on the internet. Yeah, there's nothing there. It's a complete air ball. Uh, he has done it all. We got lucky with the dresser trap rock that we yeah. started with. Yeah. It happened to have the right amount of water on a molecular level that you know was locked up in it, molecule by molecule. Technically, it's a metal basalt for those interested in those types of things. Yeah, it yeah. is advantageous for us. That, that water that's in those uh, no. relatively low temperature uh, hydrous minerals that are in the now in that metabasalt. Uh, when we cook it, they dehydrate. Uh, that water allows the lava to melt at a lower temperature. It sort of acts like a flux that goes away then. Uh, after we uh, make a nice uh, convecting homogeneous masses material, it degasses. It has to be watched. It just like a pot of pasta on your stove. Milk. It'll boil over. Milk. It's milk is yeah. the best example when oh, you're yeah. trying to simmer milk and it, it hits that point where it to the boiling and it volumetrically yep. changes and it's like you're not ready for it. And it's the same with this guy down here. It is it overflows and it kills itself. So now they got the rock, they outfitted the furnace, they figured out how to heat it up enough to melt the rock, and voila! On January 22nd, at about 11 o'clock at night in 2010, we had our first pour. Yeah. It took us a couple more, a couple hours longer than we thought to melt it because we didn't know what we were doing. But we poured out about mm, 25 kilograms of lava out of the furnace indoors, the indoor furnace. And there's a snowstorm out back and outside at the time. And yeah, it was just stunning. Geologists have a, have a sort of a, a kid one another, uh, especially those who are sort of neophytes in, uh, in terms of volcanology and often said that they have red rock fever. They go out and see this glowing orange lava and they're just just sort of mesmerized by it. And you know, I'm, I'm afraid I was afflicted, you know. Uh, me and almost everyone who's been here, I think, is afflicted to some extent. You know, every single volcanologist 
every scientist that we've had come, they just start spewing ideas. Why well, have you done this? What if you did that? Could you pour it on this? How, how could you make this? You know, they all have great ideas. You know, there's just an endless number of experiments that could be done. And uh, so th those are the things that run through your head while you're getting this sort of indoor sunburn from, uh, the, from being too close and too mesmerized. You can feel the heat, you can hear it crackling and making various sounds and, and evolving so rapidly, just over a few minutes. We started out and for the first, I guess it was a, almost a year, wasn't it? Uh, Bob was using this floor furnace that he mentioned earlier and uh, learning how to melt this, this ground up basaltic material. The crucible that we were melting material is about the size of a five gallon can, something like that. We had big crowds of people from the university coming down to see it. It was, yeah, it was, it was really a lot of fun. We poured lava all over different things doing all sorts of different experiments, pouring it onto ice, pouring it onto dry ice, pouring it onto wet sand, dry sand, steel sheets, all sorts of different things to just to sort of proof a concept to see where we might go. Bob acquired this larger furnace in Canada and got some help to get it customized for our purposes. And this thing can hold, uh, how much is it, Bob? It's a, a, few hundred pounds. 700 pounds yeah. of material, so around a little over 300 kilograms. So it's enough that we can pour the lava out and make a lava flow. It's about the size of a tabletop, yeah. easily. And it weighs 12,000 pounds. And it's, it's been so customized that it's pretty much for lava. What did other people think of their work, like other people at Syracuse? I can imagine if I saw lava in a parking lot, I'd want to know what the heck was going on. Yeah, I mean, they had people coming by and asking them, and they invited people to come, you know, see them pour in the parking lot. They even invited other scientists who just kind of were, you know, didn't believe them that they could pour lava, that, like the stuff they'd see, you know, out in the field, a real volcano. Yeah, one of the craziest things they did was they built a special furnace that allowed them to pour lava continuously for several hours. And they took this furnace on the road with them up to Toronto and poured lava for a crowd of thousands at this overnight art festival. Yeah, that, that was an exciting time and people were stunned and we were listed as like the, the it thing to see that night was the lava because it was in downtown Toronto. But we saw pours up there that were big that you only see on vents, that you see on vents on real volcanoes. I brought some samples back, and um, it was one was from this, the edge of this pool or the rampart that, fit, that, that formed in front of the, the spout itself, and it's a very different looking formation, and it, it, uh, I had a sample sitting on a table in the back, and a, a geochemist, Karen is a geochemist? Yeah. Geochemist from Colgate University. She goes, hey, who brought that to you from Mount Etna? I said, it's not from Etna. She goes, yeah, that looks like the, the vents on Etna in, from last year's eruption. I go, it's not from Etna. I made this up in Toronto. She goes, you did not effing make this. I go, yes, I effing did. She goes, you did not. She was like, really? Because her biggest criticism, which she was all, she's been, always been open with this, oh, yeah. is- And a great supporter. Big supporter, yep. big supporter, um, is we'd be limited on the different kinds of uh, uh, lavas that we'd be able to make, the different uh, phenomena that you see around lava pour. And I was, we we're always very cognizant of that, right? Sure. That we were, we were degassing this stuff out of our furnace way too much. We were getting this very, just a glass-like, mm -hmm. very clean, you know, that doesn't do much. It's almost like perfect. It's a little too perfect. It looks like what a computer uh, graphics person would generate. It's not. It, it doesn't have its all the texture and the beauty of, that lava has, and people, love, you know, it's it spoke. It was a serious performance, and that's when it really, for me, it moved from me trying to do these landscape pieces or this traditional sculpture that a lot of people wouldn't understand what land art is in terms of traditional sculpture, to something else that was about spectacle and about performance. This installation in this environment, I created this environment, and it truly was volcanic. All right, I can certainly appreciate art and science together, but I'm a scientist, so I'm interested in what did Jeff get out of this uh, as a geologist? 
So what Jeff told us is that most geologists, even those who study volcanoes, uh, you know, they haven't seen an active lava flow. They happen in remote places. They happen at the bottom of the ocean. So for the most part, you know, a lot of geologists have just seen that end product, that final hard rock. Yeah, they see what shape the lava ended up in, but they don't know how it got in that shape. So this lava project allows Jeff and Bob to really see how those shapes form what the, and figure out what the eruption was like when the lava came out. Ironically, most of the volcanic eruptions on our planet take place on mid-ocean ridges, and yet we've never even seen an active eruption on a mid-ocean ridge. But we see lots of different shaped lava flows, and so we'd love to know what accounts for those different shapes. Is it the slope? Is it the rate the lava came out? The temperature? Uh, the crystals? The, the bubbles that were in the lava? The details of the composition? So that's one of the powers of our project. We can vary those parameters one at a time or more than one. And we can look at the details of those shapes and we can watch exactly how they develop. You know, one of the really interesting things is how the crust behaves on a lava flow. The viscous core of the lava flow is beautiful, bright orange, like we like to say, Syracuse orange. And the, the black crust, though, is a viscoelastic sort of material, and then even brittle on top. But that's really what controls the shape of the lava flow. The, it's a race between the formation of that crust and the way the lava is moving and trying to break up that crust. Yeah. I think probably one of the most dramatic things that we've seen so far is one of my graduate students over the summer did a whole series of experiments with Bob pouring lava out over very gentle slopes, maybe from 2 to 10 degrees, something like that, over wet sand, ice, dry ice, as lavas might have encountered on Mars, for example. And one of the weird things that happens is uh, the ice or moisture is vaporized and it makes an air cushion for the lava flow so that it can basically hydroplane down the slope. And uh, talking to lots of other volcanologists, they say, well, that just doesn't happen. But of course, they haven't seen a lot of lava flows moving, you know? How do you know it didn't happen? This is pretty impressive. But I, I have to know, what is the craziest thing that they've done? Well, you have to hear them talk about the pillow lava. What is the pillow lava? Pillow lava is exactly what it sounds like. When lava erupts on the bottom of the ocean, something about the water temperature and the pressure makes the lava freeze into these pillow shapes. Almost looks like the top of a mushroom, these like beautiful billowy round parts. I spent a lot of time working on the bottom of the ocean, lava flows on the bottom of the ocean. And so, of course, Bob's response to this was, that, oh, we'll build a swimming pool. And so he, he built a, I guess it's about, let's see, was it? Four by four, four, by, by, four eight by eight. Feet. Plexiglass tank. Yeah, size of a big hot tub. And with a plexiglass side so we could watch sideways and uh, pour the, the lava in various ways, sometimes under the water, sometimes on top of the water. And make beautiful pillow lavas that looks exactly like the videos that you can see that have been shot off Hawaii. Mm -hmm. uh, terrific. Well, first we had to figure out how to, how to introduce the lava at the bottom of the tank because mm -hmm. dumping it in the top through the water, it fragments. Yeah. And we don't get that. But we, so we came up with a tube that we could introduce it in, in the bottom of the tank, that meter down, and um, how fast it moved across the bottom of the tank. And after our first time, we it was like that, that scene out of... Um, Jaws, where we need a bigger tank, like it wasn't big enough, and um, so we need a swimming pool. I have to say, we, we do a lot of things at, that lead to a lot of surprises, yeah. but those surprises, within hours of, after we've stopped ooing and aahing about what just happened, uh, there's some really logical and interesting uh, thing with, that we have learned. And probably one of the most interesting things and this is one of the most bizarre things we've ever done. Um, undergraduate students move each summer from one place to the next place for the next fall, and there's always the, the food that comes out of the refrigerators, right? We had one of my early assistants, uh, Philip Evans. Philip showed up here with a bunch of stuff, and he put it in the refrigerator, and we don't allow food in the refrigerator in the shop because it's made for putting in molds and as well as wax, cooling wax down stuff for different art processes. And we had a frozen chicken in there. 
And one day we were just pouring on whatever we could find and the chicken came out and we held it under the frozen lava. Uh, we held it under the lava, poured into the cavity of this chicken. And everybody thought it would cook the chicken. We were interested in it. The, smelled great. Smelled great. Thought we're going to have the lava well, chicken. chicken. Oh, lava man. chicken. And then we're going to open, we're going to franchise this. We're going to license it, right? We're going to yeah. patent it or trademark or whatever. This and will franchise be Colonel it. Sanders' next option. And we're going to do our Vegas. Crunchy lava chicken. And what we got out of it is probably the greatest thing ever cast in lava in the history of the species. <laughs> yeah. It is the perfect interior of the cavity, of the chest cavity of this chicken. It only cooked about the first quarter inch of the chicken, and the yeah. rest of it was raw and sat out in the summer sun. And every it was rib, every detail till, of the texture of the inside of that chicken cavity. And it's like chicken this cavity perfect is. black glass. What it was, it was the moisture from the chicken generated some kind of barrier, whatever it was, and annealed it just so that the thing didn't fracture. It's got this beautiful glossy coat on it, and um, it's perfect. But that's the craziest thing. It was just a stupid idea that we had extra material. We're like, you know, let's just do this. Lava chicken? Yeah, lava chicken. Who would have ever thought that an artist plus a scientist plus rock plus 1300 degrees equals lava chicken? The first couple of years, yeah. I'm quite sure Jeff was like, I'm quite sure some people, AGU thought, Jeff, you have a resume no one's gonna touch. You've been down in Alvin more than most people. What the hell are you doing playing with this art guy? So what's it like for you two working together coming from your very different backgrounds? Oh, uh, that's, yeah, we, mm. could, we could run. We're a weird, clinic, we could run. Book. This could become a 13 part series. This is a bizarre marriage. Yeah. It's your parents. They get along, there's reasons they're together, but oh my God, they stuck it out for the kids or something. Yeah. Art is all about, uh, what are we doing today? Well, let's just try this. And you throw things together until something works. No one takes measurements, no one takes notes, and it, repeatability is not in our lexicon. It's all about repeatability. So in that way, we've had to learn. We understand each other's perspectives, but yeah. this has been a road. I can give you examples in both the right and the left hand is uh, when they have an art and science project, usually the art is parasitic to the science. Or the flip side of that is looking at Pollock's painting, where they'll bring in a chaos theory person and they map the painting and say, it actually wasn't random. Now the sciences and math and those people are parasitic to this finished piece of art. This is truly unique and scary. But I'll tell you the power of those moments out there when we do have all those people around. The, regardless of their understanding of what we're doing. I have a picture that, it's one of the few pictures I have of, of lava flows, but it's, that of, it, it's not of the lava, it's of the crowd. And there's a pre-K student, he's four years old, and a doctoral student, and they're about six feet away from each other. And you can see the glow of the lava in their face, because the lava's pouring out. And it's winter. It was like yeah. you know, eight or ten inches of snow out there. It was late afternoon. Everybody's in snowsuits. And um, they had the same look of... of um, Utter wonder. Wonderment. Of like, <laughs> wow. And like, to be a teacher, I never thought, it, like, at this level, any level, to uh, do something. It, it's an incredible privilege. And, and I'm humbled by it that... You would, you would do something that would appeal to the full spectrum. I think one of my favorite moments really is actually, I think it's actually the same law before that Bob was just mentioning. You know, we, we sometimes bring out sticks with hot dogs and marshmallows. And kids can roast marshmallows and things over the cooling lava flow. You know, it's great fun for them. But the best thing is they turn to you and start asking you questions. questions. You know, how much time do you spend as an educator well, Johnny, what do you think is going to happen? Yeah. And Mary, why is doing that? You know, and it's like, stop texting for a minute. Huh? What? And we wonder why university students, uh, so many students come in. Oh, I hate math and science. It's because they haven't gotten to do science, to see uh, something like that. And it, it is a great teaching moment. It, yeah, you're so grabbed buy it and it's an opportunity we take advantage of. Yep. And I would say, I would say, at the end of the day, if I don't make any art with it, or we don't get much science out of it, but we hear about somebody, an elementary school kid that saw this, that, you know, 
knew at that moment in fifth grade I was going to become a scientist because I saw that, we win. Yeah. Right? No, it's scoreboard us. Exactly. We win. Right here? Yeah. Wow. That is not what I was expecting when you said lava in a parking lot. Yeah, it was pretty awesome. It definitely beats the whole, you know, baking soda volcano in my kitchen in fourth grade. It definitely does. <laughs> to check out more videos of Jeff and Bob's crazy experiments, go to the Syracuse Lava Project website or see photos and videos on AGU's social media channels. All right, everyone, that's our first episode of Third Pod from the Sun. Special thanks to Lauren for traveling to Syracuse with me and editing this interview. And of course, thanks to Bob and Jeff for sharing their amazing project with us. This podcast was also produced with help from Josh Spicer, Olivia Ambrosio, and Caitlin Camacho. And thanks to Tori Kerr for producing this episode. So AG would love to hear your thoughts about this new podcast. Uh, please rate and review us. Um, you can find new episodes in your favorite podcasting app or at thirdpodfromthesun.com. Thanks all, and we'll see you next time.